Okay, excellent. Then, good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour, je m'appelle Mathias. That's the only French that I speak. Uh, except for this, je ne peux pas parler le français. This is what I've learned that you need to tell if you don't, if you don't speak French properly. So I welcome you to uh, my uh, short and interactive lecture here. And you can already read the topic. It will be about, um, filters for EMC applications. And I think I will also try to, um, share my screen and hopefully this works. And so my, my computer just crashed and I needed to set up everything again. So let me see if this works. Um, and I think this is looking quite good. Okay. So before we start, and as usually I like to have this a little interactive, I have a survey for you, um, uh, just to check if it works. So the, the question is on a scale of artificial intelligence, how, how are you doing today? Um, so I would appreciate if you take your cell phone and scan this QR code and that should bring you to a web page that um, looks in a certain way that I will show you in a moment. And there should be a Q&A board and there should be also um, something that is called icebreaker, exactly. And you need to click on this icebreaker and there, yeah, there you should have this nine answer options from the mechanical Turk over the calculator to the more or less intelligent coffee machine. Um, hell. The character from Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, 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 Terminator, Neo from the Matrix movie and the last one, I don't recognize the last one, to be honest. So the webpage should look like this. Um, and here you find this icebreaker question. And here you also have a Q&A board where you can pop in questions if you like. Then I might be come back to this later. So today, mm, I'm, I, I, I don't hit coffee yet. So I will, I will send, I will, I will choose this one. And so let's take a look at your results. Uh, no, I don't want to have this. Um, I don't want to go to Ergebnisse. So. No, I think I'm, I'm somewhere stuck in the wrong mode. I need to go to icebreaker and then maybe present. Okay, excellent. And there should be your results. So there's a, there's a favorite, there's a winner and it's, it's number four. So it's, uh, hell 9,000 from the, from the movie, the, the, the computer that would like to kill everyone at the end, every human. Okay. So thanks for this. So then maybe some words about myself. Um, I was born in 1984. You can calculate yourself how, how old I am. And, and this year it's especially easy. I married, I have two children and I live in Magdeburg in Germany. I will tell you in a moment where this is located uh, within Germany. And I have a background in electric engineering. So I studied also electric engineering um, more than 20 years ago. And since then I'm working as a scientific coworker. I also did my PhD on this topic. Uh, with a quite complicated title that you can more or less read here. And since almost 10 years, I'm teaching as flying faculty. So I do stuff like this, go on exchange programs. Um, I've been to Russia several times because we had a cooperation with a university there in Kazan and Tatarstan, but obviously this, this does not work anymore for known reasons. And so I've been last year in Angers for the international week and I found it so nice that I came back this year. Um, to continue with, with a different topic. So this is my building and place where I work in Magdeburg, where my office and some of our laboratories are located. Um, and this is a picture of our city. So it's, I think, um, Magdeburg is quite comparable to Angers. So we also have a river. It's called Elbe. We also have a cathedral. 
and we have um, we have a bit more inhabitants. So I, I've learned yesterday that Angers has something that around 150,000 inhabitants, right? So, so, something like this. And we have 200, 250,000. I mean, it's always a question how you calculate and how, how, what, what, what you all count in. So we are maybe a bit larger, but it's... Um, yeah, still, it, I mean, Angers, I would say, is a very green city. Magdeburg is a very green city. And... Um, Not. <laughs> I mean, yesterday I was running around the Eton Saint, Saint Nicolas, and this is very beautiful, I think. And so we have also nice and large parks in Magdeburg. And if you go and come uh, to study at our university, we also have a park very close by to our university where there are lots of uh, students partying in the summer and having a barbecue and so on. Okay, so if you wonder where Magdeburg is located, uh, we are somewhere in this triangle between Berlin that most of you might know and Dresden as a touristic city and Hanover. So we are one and a half hours by train or by car west of Berlin. And um, yeah, so I, I came by train via Cologne, which is somewhere here and then Brussels and Paris and then finally to Angers. And I, I already told the story on Monday that I had some issues with the metro in Paris and I got a ticket from the police and but I, I won't tell the story again. So um, our university in Magdeburg is named after Otto van Gericke. Um, I don't know if you have heard about him. He was he lived um, uh, 400 years ago approximately and he was also a mayor of the city at that time. And he was also a researcher and a scientist and a physicist. And uh, there's some, some good morning. Uh, there's also some, some interesting story about his name that is somehow connected with the French language because he, he was a German guy. And so it's pronounced Gericke. And originally he was written without this U there. Gericke. I don't know. Do you learn German? Does someone of you learn German? No. But okay, some a, li a little bit, un petit peu. So, uh, Gericke, and so then he married. Later on, he married a French woman, a French lady, and because then of the French pronunciation, you would not call it Gericke, but Gericke, right? And so because of this, he they did this trick and introduced the U and as far as I've learned and because of the U you don't say Girik but you say Girik right yeah and so because of the French language he has this U uh, within his name and what he's popular for or what he's f famous and known for is um, this experiment um, with the Magdeburg hemispheres have you heard about this so he did experiments with vacuum and to show the, the force of the vacuum, or let's say to show the force of the, of the pressure of air, he took two large hemispheres, about 60 centimeter in diameter, and put them together, but just with a seal in between. Not, not screwed together, nothing like this, just a seal. And he pumped, he also kind of invented the air pump, and he sucked the air out of these hemispheres. So that the hemispheres were just, pushed together by the force of the external air. And to show how, how strong and how powerful this, this pressure is, he did a very um, impressive and an interesting experiment. He was also, he, he kind of invited, maybe um, invented science communication. So they took these hemispheres and put eight horses on one side and eight horses on the other side. And these eight horses or 16 horses in total were not able to pull the spheres apart to separate them from each other. And so then the legend, the legend says that then a small boy child came, uh, opened up the valve, the air would flow back in into the hemispheres and they would just fall apart. So very, um, yeah, illustrative experiment to show the force of the air pressure and sometimes so we, we repeat this experiment, so we have done it last year, not with 16, but with 12 horses for the anniversary of the uh, university in Magdeburg. So you, you might know this also from, um, from some trousers. So 
Um, same experiment, different force. So I think Levi Strauss, he, he kind of borrowed the idea to show how strong these genes are. Okay, so then some organizational issues. If you want to have a copy of the slides, um, I will send them to Regie and, and he might share it with you. Or I, 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 will, I will try to upload them maybe if I get an account to this Moodle system that you are using. Or you can, I can, you can, I'm very easy to Google. You can just send me an email and uh, I, I will be happy to share it with you. I, I will also try a recording. And you never know with this mobile and improvised equipment if it works. So um, as I said, my computer just crashed before. So let's see. And if you have questions in between, um, feel free to ask these questions and, and raise your arm. And I mean, by the way, let me check because um, my computer just crashed and I've not checked before if now the right microphone is set in here. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So... Um, yeah, then we can really start with the topic. So I would like to explain a little bit what electromagnetic compatibility is and show you some example that is somehow related to what I am trying to explain you filters. And for this, I've also brought some experiments and to, to understand and to really dive into this filter topic, we might have a short reminder and recap of some circuit simulation, circuit calculation fundamentals. So that's approximately the plan for today. Uh, let's see how far we will go. So um, first thing is, what is this EMC? What is this electromagnetic compatibility? And I have a second survey and question for you. So would be great if you go to this website once again, but uh, I need to enable this question first, which is here on intro, and I will enable it. And so now um, on your page, if you, if you go to home again, there should be a second question set, which is called intro. And if you click on this, you should see two questions. How much do you already know about EMC? And uh, there's also a second question. And I can, I can show the link once again, sure. And oh. um, okay, this was, this was just a projector. Okay, so, but it's the same QR code, the same link as before, the same web page. So if your browser remembered this. So let's um, have a look at the results. Okay, so um, I would interpret this as that one or two persons say they know something. One person knows maybe a lot and the other person say, no, not really. Um, z zero to nothing. Okay. Thanks for this. And then we can also have a look at the second question. How interested are you in this topic? And okay. <laughs> I, I, I will do my best to make it interesting for you. Okay. Thanks for this. So what does EMC and what does it mean? So we are all using lots of electric, electronic devices every day and everywhere. And we expect that these devices nicely work with each other without causing any disturbance and without any interference. And I mean, for example, such a cell phone, if you call someone or if you get a call, it will on purpose radiate electromagnetic waves because it needs them for communication and also needs them for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and whatnot. But for example, um, especially if you call someone and if the cell phone has to reach the next base station, it needs more powerful electromagnetic waves to cover this distance. So devices emit electromagnetic waves on purpose or unintentionally. And every cable that you have somewhere, for example, here the cable connected to my camera or the cable going to the projector, um, 
every cable that you have somewhere also acts as an antenna and might pick up these signals. And so if I, if I would call someone, I would not like to have disturbances on the picture of the camera or uh, disturbances on the picture of the projector. So that there, there should be no interference. There should be no disturbance. And this is what we call electromagnetic compatibility. So it's the, the brief definition is it's the ability of some equipment to function satisfactorily into a certain electromagnetic environment. And at the same time, it should not radiate or put disturbances into the very same environment. So there are two, two aspects in there. Emission, it should not emit and it should be immune to external stuff. Okay, and we can put this into a very simple coupling model and say there are sources of disturbances and there are victims of disturbances and there is some coupling path in between. And a simple example would be you have your Wi-Fi router at home. This also creates electromagnetic waves. So the coupling path would be some electromagnetic field. And then the victim of the disturbance might be a screen, might be a TV set, something like this. And every time this radiates, then you get some um, disturbances here. And so EMC, we are also kind of the reason why you are not allowed or why you are asked to switch off your cell phone in an airplane. Because once again, electromagnetic waves from the cell phone um, could interfere with the control systems of the aircraft. And so now we can have a more detailed look onto this coupling path. So this coupling between the source and the victim of a disturbance can happen via cables. Um, then we call it conductive coupling or galvanic coupling. And so in this case, and this is what we're also talking about today, what helps there is to, you introduce filters that let useful signals through and that block disturbance signals. So then coupling can also happen via electric fields. Then we would call it capacitive coupling. If you have high electric fields somewhere and if the electric field changes over time, then you can have a current flowing over some, some parasitic capacitance. That's why capacitive coupling. Um, the same can happen via magnetic field. Then we would call it inductive coupling. Um, this is, for example, often a problem with tram lines. So Angers also has a tram system with three lines, uh, as far as I know. So Magdeburg, we have a little more. I think we have nine or ten or so. But these trams um, use a high current for driving on the drive wire on the catenary. And so if you have a current going on a wire, you also have, get a magnetic field around the wire. And you also get this magnetic field not just very close to the, to the tram line, but also in a larger distance, 10 meters even 100 meters, you can still measure them. And if you have devices that are sensitive to changes of the magnetic field, like in a hospital, like electron microscopes, magnetic resonance imaging devices, yeah, MRI scanners, then they can, uh, there can be disturbances um, from the tram to such MRI scanners, for example. And if we go to high frequencies, like with the cell phone, um, then we we have wave fields, we get electromagnetic fields, then the electric field and the magnetic field, they cannot be separated from each other anymore. So at high frequencies, you always have electric and magnetic field. There's a nice talk of a German colleague of mine, um, Andreas Bachanski, who's working for a company CST, Computer Simulation Technology, that belongs to Dassault, which is, I think, a French company. And they... They do software for numerical field simulation. And he, is a, he has a talk about this that is called ENH, the electric and the magnetic field component. They are instant best friends forever because at high frequencies, you cannot split them apart. You, if you have an electric field, you always have a magnetic field and vice versa. Okay, so now we can have a look at some example. And the example that I've chosen for today and for this lecture is electric vehicles. So does someone of you, I, I don't expect that you have your own car yet, but uh, does some of your family drive an electric vehicle? Has someone has an electric car? No, all, all classical cars with a combustion engine. But I mean, some electrical, if you have an electric car, of course you, um, you don't have a combustion engine, you don't have gas, you don't go to the gas station, but you, you need to charge it and you have some electric powertrain. 
And so if we take a look at this electric powertrain, um, it starts, let's say, with the power grid, with the charger, with your outlet somewhere. And the question is, what type of voltage do we have here? 230 volts and and it's AC. And if you have a if you have a good and powerful charger for fast charging, then it might be not just this two phase 230 volts AC. It might be three phase with 400 volts AC. But this is AC. And we want to store energy in the battery of the car. So um, the battery. What type of voltage do we have there? It's the DC voltage, and do you know approximately what is the voltage level of of some um, electric car battery? Yeah, a, a couple of hundred volts. So typically something maybe like 300, 400 volts. It depends, of course, also on the state of charge. Um, and and why do you need so high voltages in the car battery? I mean, a, a classical car, your car that you drive just has a 12 volt battery right um, so why does the electric vehicle needs much higher voltages so if when the with the car you want to go fast and you want to accelerate fast and for this you need high power um, power in electrical terms how can you calculate power from electrical quantities Yeah, it's current times voltage, right? And so if you want to have a high power, you, you, need, you need to have, let's say, high voltage and high current. Um, and you don't want to be the current, you don't want the current to be super high because if you have high currents in a car, you need very thick cables and it's very expensive and very heavy and stuff. So you, you somehow want to limit the current, still you want to have a high power. So you need to ramp up the voltage. And that means that's why for some electric vehicle, you cannot just go with a 12 volt battery anymore. You need higher voltages. But the thing is, it's, it's DC. So if this is AC and this is DC, uh, we need something in between that converts between DC and AC. We need to have a rectifier. And finally, we want to get some mechanical power in the motor. So what type of motors are used in these cars? Some brushless motors and these brushless motors at the end are, let's say, synchronous machines. Um, but it's, it's once again, it's some, it's some AC motor. So it's three phase or sometimes even more phases, but it's AC. So you, you, you could also build cars with DC motors, but if, you, if it would be classical DC motors with brushes, then you would need to replace the brushes, I don't know, every... 10,000 kilometers or so. So you want to have brushless motors or AC motors, synchronous, asynchronous motors. So once again, you need to have, you need to convert the DC from the battery into AC from the motor. So you need to have um, something in between that does this, what is called an inverter. And now we can have a look at how this looks like and how this looks like. So the rectifier looks like this. Have you seen this before? Do you know how it works? Okay. So then um, we can have a look at the inverter. This looks like this. Uh, have you seen this before? Okay. So you had some lecture about power electronic systems or where, where did you use it? Uh, yes. Okay. So. Um, to explain this a little bit, I mean, have you an idea how it works? Okay. Try try to explain it, and I will I will try to make a schematic and draw it. Uh, before this, I need to find the corresponding program, which is I think called Open Board, and there it is. 
then I can show my screen and draw on top of it. So here we have a DC voltage. And I mean, here at this place, we always want to have a current going into this direction. And so let's say here at the end, we want to have the case that we also want to have a current here going downwards. And so to achieve this, what do we do? We close this switch. If we close this switch, we will have this current here going downwards, current here going also to the right, going to our load. Then the current will return on this wire. And so then we also need to close this switch. Current will go downwards here. Current will go to the left here. Will return here and loop. the current will go upwards here and will go up. And now let's see if I can switch the color here somewhere. Um, maybe to blue. And to show the screen once again. So now let's assume we want to get a different direction of the current here going upwards. What do we do then? So in this case, we need to close this switch here, right? So we have a current here still going to the right. Then it will go downwards to this switch. We'll go to this node. We'll go here in the opposite direction. We'll here go upwards. Then it will here go on this wire to the left. Then we also need to close this switch. The current will go down downwards here and will return here to the left and still will go here upwards. So you can see that we can have a, a DC current and voltage on this side that we can invert into alternating current on voltage on this side. This is what the inverter does. And so the question is now, what, what do you use as switches there in this inverter? Yeah, it's, it's MOSFETs, metal oxide field effect transistors or IGBT's insulated gate bipolar transistors, but it's transistors. It's um, semiconductor switching elements. And so I, I said I've brought lots of experimental equipment with me. So I also have, I have a box and there are some transistors in the box. So, I mean, this is how, transistors, how you may know them, right? Um, and these MOSFETs and IGBTs, they are they are a little larger. I think I also have one, one or two power transistors in here. So they, they look like this. Yeah. So you can see they are flat on the back side. So you can mount them on a heat sink to dissipate heat. And for, for an electric car, for an electric vehicle, they, they, they of course would be even larger. So I think with this one, you can maybe, um, switch a power of maybe 100 watts, which, which would be sufficient to charge a laptop or to operate a computer. But for a car, there would be at least the size of your thumb, something like this, um, to, to, to be able to deliver this power. Okay, so um, let's... Go to the next slide and I think I need to, I will just close this one here. So then the output of this inverter looks like this. Um, you switch on and off and you get something like a rectangular pulse or a, a trapezoidal pulse because it will not, of course, it will not instantly switch on and off. Um, even the MOSFET and IGBT, they need some time for switching. And so now this is how this pulse looks like in time domain. And now we would like to look at this also in frequency domain. Um, have you heard of Fourier series and Fourier transform? Yeah. So if we do it, 
For this, then the result would look like this, at least if we look at the envelope of this amplitude spectrum, then we get something at small frequencies, which is constant. And then there's the first corner frequency or first break frequency somewhere here. And this depends on the pulse width here, on this tau, which is the pulse width. And after this first break frequency, the amplitude goes down with minus 20 dB per decade. Have you, have you done calculations in decibels already? Okay, yeah. So it means that if we double the frequency, the amplitude will go down by a factor of two. Or if you have 10 times the frequency, amplitude will go down by a factor of 10. And then there's a second break frequency and a second corner frequency. And this depends on the rise time, which is this one here. And so after this second break frequency and corner frequency, the amplitude goes down with minus 40 dB per decade, which means if you double the frequency, you just get, uh, you divide the amplitude by four. Or if you have 10 times the frequency, you just have a hundredth part of the amplitude. And you can see that um, if, you, if we have shorter pulses and if we switch faster, then one over something small gives something large. So the shorter the pulses are in time domain, the, the more broadband will be the spectrum. The more higher frequencies, this is the frequency axis here, I mean, the higher the frequency that we get in the spectrum. Something that is very, very short in time will be very, very broad in spectrum and will contain high frequencies. And once again, then these high frequencies can disturb, might disturb other devices. And this is, this is probably what we, what we need filters for. So the thing is now, and this is the everlasting conflict between power electronics and electromagnetic compatibility. Um, as long as there's power electronics, there will be always also EMC problems to deal with. If we now look at one switching event of this MOSFET or this IGBT or this power transistor, and let's say at the beginning, the switch is open. So if the switch is open, you have no current, zero current, but you have full voltage. And, and then we, we, we close the switch. And if the switch is closed, you have no or almost no voltage anymore across the switch, but you have full current. And during switching, um, the current needs to increase and the voltage needs to decrease. And so for a certain amount of time, you have current and voltage at the same time. So if you have current and voltage, we have power, which is this light blue curve here. And now if you multiply power with time, or if you integrate power over time, what do you get? You get energy. And, ener and this is energy that is lost or that is dissipated in the switching element, in the MOSFET, in the IGBT, and that will heat it up. That's why you need this heat sink and you need to somehow cool it. And so now, of course, if you want to have a high efficient converter or if you want to have low losses in the converter, if you don't want to, to get such a high switching energy, what can you do to lower this energy, to decrease it? You have to register switching. We have to switch faster because... We, we cannot change the voltage level. This is the voltage level given by our battery. We, we cannot change the amplitude of the current because this is the current that we need to drive the car. So the only thing that we can do is to, to lower the switching losses is to switch faster, to shorten this time. And I mean, that's why power electronic people, they always try to switch as fast as possible. Switch in, in nanoseconds, in, less, in, in, in some hundreds of picoseconds. Um, and then the EMC people come and say, oh no, don't, don't switch that fast because the faster you switch and the shorter these pulses are, the higher we go in frequency and the more high frequency disturbances and so on uh, we have and we get in our spectrum. Okay, so then next and last question for you is, do you know other EMC problems? Um, from your daily life that um, 
or, or maybe maybe from your study and I need to go back and also enable this uh, question set which should be here examples and uh, I will enable it and then once again it show up on your home screen here once again as examples and I can I will sh show the link once again and you can you can pop in some idea there that you I don't know what you what you experience in your daily life or what you read about or uh, what you maybe learned about in other seminars And at this time, I also say hello to the two people um, in the live stream. Write something nice in the chat. Let me know if this works. And now I will switch back to my browser. And... Uh, go to present mode once again and go to the examples and there are four answers already so I will show them and we have two times no um, a cell phone on a microwave yeah so microwave ovens are also a quite good source for disturbances um, because they operate at high frequencies and for the microwave oven um, it cannot be too expensive so the door and everything else around is not super good shielded. Do you know what with which frequency a microwave oven operates? It's, it's 2.4 gigahertz so it's the same frequency as Wi-Fi and also as Bluetooth and so I also have a cheap Bluetooth headset at home and if I'm with this Bluetooth headset in the kitchen it works perfectly fine but when I switch on a microwave oven then it it I hear disturbances and you can hear the like how the microwave oven switches on and off the magnetron in the in the Bluetooth speaker. Um okay, radio interference is the same also with um with cell phones. I can I think I have it here somewhere. Um, I can also show my show my old cell phone, and I think last year I've also done this experiment. Um, so with older cell phones that are working with the 2G system, this is also some EMC problem that some of you might remember if you have such a phone like this. And if you sit in front of a computer or also a radio receiver, and if you get a call or if you call someone. Uh, then you hear this characteristic noises, beep, 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 some some disturbances that that come from this from these type of cell phones. And um, yeah, that can disturb or that create radiated emissions, uh, disturb FM radio, electromagnetic pollution. Um, yeah, it's it's not a very scientific term, but okay, this is what what some people are afraid of. And I mean, what what we can do against this is um, use shielding, Faraday cages, and the the microwave oven that you have at home is more or less a Faraday cage, but it's not very perfect. And I mean, that's why it still kind of creates disturbances. Okay, uh, very good and very interesting ideas. Thank you for this. And so then we can have a quick uh, reminder of some circuit circulation circuit calculations. And the first question is, what do you know about current and voltage in network calculation circuit calculations? What what rules or what laws apply? Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, right, but the, uh, the, um, the Ohm law. There's Ohm's law. We will come back to this in a second. So this ha somehow um, <coughs> takes into account current and voltage at resistors. But if you, if you let's say at first we, we, we look at um, circuits, 
how to calculate what, what there's a relation between voltages and there's a relation between currents and circuits. What, what laws do you use to uh, do circuit calculation? Yes, there, there, there are two of them. One relates voltages to each other and the other one relates currents to each other. And it's, uh, in French, but not in... Uh... <laughs> say, in, say in French, I will... Nah, maybe. So I would say it's, it's Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. Have you heard about Kirchhoff's laws? Ah, okay. Yeah, so Kirchhoff's voltage law says if you, a, if you have a loop somewhere in the current, if you have a mesh, and if you take the sum of all the currents um, within this mesh, the total sum will be zero. And there's Kirchhoff's current law that says if you have a node somewhere and if you have currents flowing towards this node and flowing away from this node, the total sum of all the currents will also be zero. Well, and that's like a when Kirchhoff is like uh, the reset that I already knew. Okay. Okay. Yeah, or you could, th this one you could also write it in a way that the sum of the incoming currents must be the sum of the outgoing currents. Okay, so then what else do you know about current and voltage? You already mentioned Ohm's law. So current and voltage are proportional to each other at some resistor. So the more current you have, also the more voltage you get or vice versa. So what, what other equations are there? Or what other circuit elements do you know in fundamentals of electric engineering? Passive and linear. So I have... I have something small here. I don't know. I've somewhere... Um, that this this room is full of experimental equipment, um, but if you if you take if you take a wire and wound it, what do you get? This one is just very very small. I don't have a larger one right here right now. It's a coil, and it's some inductance, right? So at the inductance or at the inductor, we have. Faraday's law and Lenz's law, uh, which says if we have a time derivative of the current, if the current is changing, then we get a voltage. And, and this Lenz law says that this voltage is opposite to the direction of the original current. So um, if the current changes, there is some voltage induced opposing the change of the current. So it's yeah, so, so the um, the, the picture here would say so the, the current would like to change and then the adductor says no please don't change stay the same yeah okay so this is inductance uh, what else do we have capacitance and capacitance is more or less the same equation but just voltage and current change the order so here if the time if we have a time derivative of the voltage, then we get a current. And voltage at the capacitor is proportional to the charge. So this is more or less the voltage charge, current and charge rule. Um, so if the charge changes, then we have a current flow somewhere. And I mean, this picture here um, means if, if we have a constant voltage, if, if we have a DC voltage, what happens to this time derivative? Yeah, it's exactly. And so if we, if you have a constant voltage and if you calculate the time derivative, this term here of this constant voltage, it will be zero. So then the current will also be zero. So you cannot have a current, a DC current going over, over the capacitor. So it will block DC, but AC can go through, not the way like this, but you know. Okay, so then the next question is, 
Um, th these equations here are written in time domain with this time derivatives. And it's not very comfortable to use them for calculations because you need to, uh, you get differential equations. So um, what we do is exactly we go into frequency domain, we use complex phasors. So question is, how do these equations now look like for complex phasors? Okay. Um, so um, I mean, we can. So for resistors, it just stays the same. So it's the very same equation, just written with this complex phasors. For for the inductor, the time derivative turns into a multiplication with j omega. And for the for the capacitor, it's the same. And so. Um, this one here then means if we, if you apply a voltage to an inductor and if you have a high frequency, if the frequency is high, then the current will be small. So the inductor will block AC currents, but DC currents can go through, no problem. It's like a short circuit for DC, but an open circuit for AC. And here it's it's exactly the opposite. So if we have a low um, frequency, um, even if we have a high voltage, we will get no current. But if you have a high frequency, you will also have a high current. So this, once again, the capacitor blocks DC, lets AC pass. And here it's, it's exactly the opposite with the inductor. And this omega there, this is the, the angular frequency. And angular frequency, um, is just two times p the regular frequency and is measured in one over second. Okay, so this is, as you know, how resistors look like. Why do we have these colored rings? To, to know how, how large um, the resistor is. So there are these tables there uh, with all the different colors for three band and four band and, and five band resistors. And on my box here, um, that I brought with my experimental equipment. There's also such a table here on, on the front uh, for three band resistors. And there's a similar table um, on the inside for four band and five band resistors. And so now I need to enable another camera here on my computer. Um, this one there that should show um, what is happening behind my computer. And so I have some, I've brought some resistors here and you can see the color code is, uh, it's difficult to see, but it's brown, black and, and orange. And brown, black and orange means it's a, um, it's a 10 kilo ohm resistor. And so I have two of them um, and I will remove them from this board and then I have a nice measurement instrument that I will use for the first experiment. It's called Analog Discovery 2. It's from a company called Digiland, which somehow belongs to National Instruments. And I have an extension board here and you can read what it is it's some impedance analyzer. So it can measure impedance by amplitude and phase or as a, as a complex quantity um, with respect to frequency. And there is um, these two things here are the terminus where I can connect something. And I mean, that's why I've also bent this resistor here in this strange way that it nicely fits in there. So let's connect it. And then I need to find the proper USB cable and connect the USB cable to my computer. And this was just the mouse being disconnected. And this is the, the instrument being connected. And then I need to find the proper software on my computer. And I mean, the question is uh, at first that, 
we, we can ask well, why why do you need to know these colors um, to know the resistor? But you you, you never know. Um, yeah, sometimes you might get a capture like this. Please mark all the printed circuits boards with 220 ohm resistors, and then you need to know about the color code. Okay, so let's measure the impedance of this resistor. And so this is the corresponding software waveforms for this digital thing. And I will go to impedance analysis. And I will set a frequency range going from 100 hertz maybe to 100 kilohertz. And then we have um, 50 points per decade. And I will select that we will get the um, impedance by magnitude and by phase. So this is the frequency axis. In the first plot you get magnitude. In the second plot we get phase. And now I will push this single button in a second. So what, what would you expect as a curve if I measure the impedance of the resistor? It should be just a straight curve, right? So straight curve for the magnitude and straight curve for the phase. And the phase should be, should be zero degrees. So let's check it out. I will press start. And then you see how it's sweeping through the frequency range. And as, as mentioned, we get a straight curve, 10 kilo ohm and zero degree phase. Okay. So. Let's switch back to my camera and I will disconnect this resistor once again and we can continue with another um, circuit element. This one here, what, what is this? What could this be? This is a capacitor. So I will connect this capacitor. So snapped in and is now securely connected. And you can see <clears throat> I have lots of other capacitors on this board here. And uh, it's just because these capacitors don't have these different color codes and are just very, very tiny numbers on them. And this is the, a, a good way just to keep them in order and to know what is which capacitor. So now going back to, to the measurement instrument here. Um, if, if I now once again click the start button, what would you expect for the frequency dependent impedance of the capacitor? How should the curve look like? The, the impedance of the capacitor is 1 over j omega c. So we divide by omega. So the larger the frequency, the smaller the impedance. We should, we should get a curve that goes down with frequency, as you mentioned. And the phase should be 90 degree or minus 90 degree, because 1 over j is the same as minus j is minus 90 degree. So let's hit start. And see what it does. And so then we can see, okay, we really get an impedance that is going down with frequency. And we get a phase that is minus 90 degree. So exactly as expected. Um, so let's switch back to the camera. And I have another, I don't know, before switching back to the camera, of course, I can also measure capacitance here. So... Um, I switch to this capacitance mode. I just cl click run once again. And then we can see this is um, 47 nanofarad capacitor. Okay, so I have, I have another capacitor here. Which is this one. And this should be a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And for this one to be connected, I need to have, uh, I forgot to uh, prepare I need to have a second cable set, which 
should be somewhere here. Yeah. So I need two more cables to connect it and I need two small adapter pins. So I will I will once again put this capacitor here on my on my board. There it is. And then I I will put these two pins into the into the instrument. So one on this side and one on the other side. And then I can use these cables to connect them on one side and on the other side to to the capacitor on the breadboard and connect the cables here. So one on this side and one cable on the other side. Okay, so now these cables are connected to the impedance analyzer and connected to my to the capacitor and this is now a 100 nanofarad capacitor so it has a higher capacitance than before so if i switch back to this impedance measurement um no yeah so this is this was the measured impedance curve now if i have a larger capacitor what should happen to the curve It should be smaller, right? Because impedance is 1 over j omega c. If we have a larger capacitance, the impedance should get smaller. So here you can see we start with something like 30, 40 kilo ohms. If I hit start again, now we have something like 15, 20, somewhere in this range. Okay, and we can see that the impedance really behaves like this. That here we have, let's say, 20 kilo ohm. And we have 100 hertz. If we have 10 times the frequency, if we increase the frequency to 1 kilohertz, now we have just 2 kilo ohms anymore. So 10 times the frequency, just tens of the impedance. If we have 10 times more frequency, we just have 200 ohm anymore, just a tens. And if we go to 10 times more frequency, we just have 20 ohm anymore. So it's really this, this exact behavior that we would expect. Okay, so. Now I will do something and I will go to higher frequencies. I will go to one megahertz of frequency and hit again the start button. So you can see, okay, impedance is going down, going down, going down. Oh, something interesting happening there. If I increase the frequency even more, if I go to 10 megahertz, which is somehow the maximum frequency of this measurement instrument here, and once again hit the start button, Oh, impedance is going down, going down, but then, oh, something's happening and impedance is going up. Why is this? What is happening here? So, the, the cables that I use to connect Exactly, the cables form a loop and the loop has some inductance and that's why we are measuring the inductance of the loop. That's why the impedance is increasing once again with frequency and that's why you can see the, that the phase changes from minus 90 degree to something like plus 90 degree. Okay, so then we can go for the last thing here which is um, this inductor. And you can see that there's a 103 on this inductor. Or oh, wait, before we go to the inductor, just one, one short thing. If I once again go to capacitance and measure the capacitance, uh, then we should see, okay, this is really a 100 nanofarad capacitor. This is approximately twice the capacitance as before and of course at the end this measurement somehow fails because then the model just does not fit anymore. Okay, so then we can 
Um, as the last experiment with this impedance analyzer, go to this, can come to this inductor. And there's a 103 on this inductor. And the 103 means, um, I can show it, try to show it on the, um, on the thing here, the 103 means it's a 10 millihenry inductor from a company called Coilcraft. And so let me connect this inductor to my, to my printed circuit board. I will do it here somewhere on top. And just reconnect these cables to this position, which should be like this. So now the inductor is connected to my impedance analyzer. And I will go back to the impedance mode and change the frequency back to 100 kilohertz and do a single run. And no, I will, I will stop. Um, so what would we expect now for the impedance of the inductor as a function of frequency? It should grow, it should increase because impedance is J omega L. So if I hit start, then we see, ah, okay, it's not really increasing, it's staying constant, but then it's increasing with frequency and the phase should be 90 degree, right? But it's not at the beginning, it's not really 90 degree, it's more like, more like starting with 15 degree, but then it goes up to 90 degree. So why, why, is, why is this happening? And if, if, I, if I go to lower frequencies, if I start already with 10 hertz and run the measurement again, so then you can see measurement takes much longer time because lower frequency means larger periodic time. So the measurement takes more time. And we see, okay, the curve is not increasing. It's more staying constant and staying constant and then maybe up to this where we had uh, the 100 hertz before, then it's starting to increase, starting to increase going up. Why, why is this? Exactly. It's because this inductor is made out of a wire and the wire has resistance. And so at low frequencies, we are measuring the resistance. At high frequencies, we are measuring the inductance. At low frequencies, phase is zero degree. At higher frequencies, phase goes up to 90 degree. So I will go back to 100 hertz of starting frequency and will increase the frequency range, uh, the, the upper frequency to one megahertz once again and run the measurements so we can see, okay, frequency is increasing, increasing, increasing. Oh, another interesting effect happening here. Um, if I, if I go to even higher frequencies, the 10 megahertz and run the measurement again, we can see, okay, impedance is increasing. And how would you call this? A resonance, some resonant frequency, a peak, an impedance peak, and then the impedance is decreasing again, and you can see that the phase is going from 90 plus 90 degree very rapidly to minus 90 degree. So what what is happening here and why? Yeah, now the inductor acts like a capacitor, but where's where's the capacitance hidden in this inductor? I mean, it's, it's this, it's this very small coil. I have, I have more of these coils to, to show. So this is all how they look like, but uh, why is, why is there some capacitance inside this inductor? Anyone an idea? It's because, I mean, you take a long wire and you wound it like a coil. And, and we have learned that um, the 
that the inductor is like a block for high frequencies. So it's very easy, uh, it's very difficult for the current at high frequencies to go through the inductor. But there's, between all the different layers of the wires inside the coil, there's a small capacitance between each and every wire. A parasitic capacitance, and even if this capacitance is very, very small, then at higher frequencies, it gets easier to pass for the current over the capacitance from one layer to the next layer to the next layer and not really go the long way through all the coils or through all the windings. And that's why we get this uh, parasitic capacitance effect at high frequencies for the inductor. And that's why the impedance goes down once again. So take home message for you is capacitors not always act as a capacitor at high frequencies. They can act like an inductor because of the um, inductance of the wire. And for an inductor, it's exactly the opposite. So they're more at high frequencies. They can also act like capacitor because of the parasitic capacitance between the windings. Okay. So then I will already close this software here. And I don't want to save the current workspace. No, thanks. And we can go back to the slides. And we have done now experiments with the capacitors. Yeah, so no. Electrolytic capacitors, if you apply a too high voltage, they can sometimes blow up. Uh, but this can happen to all stuff. Um, every machine is a smoke machine if you operate it wrong enough. So finally, we can come to the topic of filters. So the question is, what means filtering? And as already discussed, we want to have the low frequency currents in the electric vehicle because we, we need them to operate the engine or the, the, the motor, the electric drive. But we don't want to have the high frequencies because the high frequencies might disturb the radio, might disturb the cell phone, might disturb other devices, sensors and stuff. So some currents should go through, other currents should be blocked. And it's a little bit the same like if you drink coffee. Uh, you want to have the good taste of the coffee, but you don't want to have the coffee powder in your mouth. So you, you need to have a filter um, to filter between them. So now for our MC application, we want to have a low pass filter. So how does this low pass filter need to look like? And I will once again have my drawing program here. And show the screen so that I can draw on this. And no, I don't want to have an update. Thanks. So how, how must the filter look like that acts like a low-pass filter? Exactly. We could do something like this. If we, if we have input terminals, if let's say this here is our input, and we have a we have an input voltage, then we can have a resistor like this, a resistor in series and a capacitor in shunt or in parallel configuration. And then here, this would be our output terminus at the end. And let's say here we have a voltage U2. So, okay, wh why does it act as a low pass filter if we have a current? Um, current can pass through the resistor. Resistor does not care if it's high or low frequency. But if we have a current here with a high frequency, it can be, then, then this is like a short circuit for high frequencies or slow impedance for high frequencies. So high frequencies will go back to the source, will go back to the ground. But low frequencies for low frequencies, it's a block. So low frequencies will go to the output. So if I, if I draw a diagram of the transfer function, and let's say here it's the ratio between the output voltage and the input voltage, and we will just take a look at the magnitude. And here this is our frequency axis. And let's say this axis is logarithmically scaled. And let's say uh, this axis is also logarithmically scaled. How should this transfer function look like? It should be, it should stay constant, right? Because low frequencies should go through. 
and then we have a break frequency and then it goes down with frequency and should be the same minus 20 dB per decade thing. Now the question is how, how, how could we calculate this or how at, at which frequency does this happen? And why does the curve look like this? How could we write down a formula or derive a formula for this problem? How could I calculate the output voltage here with respect to the input voltage in the circuit? And the rule that we could use, I don't know if you have heard of this, is a voltage divider. Have you heard about this? So how can we apply this voltage divider rule to our circuit here to this problem? So this is this would be this would be the full voltage across both elements and this would be the partial voltage just above the capacitor. So if we want to have this partial voltage with respect to the full voltage what should be on top of this fraction the the impedance of the capacitor so it be, would should be 1 over j omega c as we have discussed and what should be in the denominator the resistor plus Plus, plus the impedance of the capacitor. So here we have R plus 1 over J omega and C. And so this equation does not look very nice because of this double fraction. So what we can do to get rid of this double fraction? We can multiply by J omega C. So here it's cancelled and cancelled and here it's added. So here we have one J omega C. So at the end we get 1 over 1 plus J omega R C. And so this means if the frequency is very low, then here the 1 wins against this term. So we get 1 over 1. So we get this constant 1 that we have here. And at higher frequencies, if omega is large, then this terms wins against the one. So we get one over omega and we get this one over omega going down. And then there is this break frequency in between and the break frequency happens at, um, well, corner frequency is at one over RC, right? That depends on this RC. Okay, so this is how this should look like. And so now we can come to a second experiment. And for this, um, yeah, I think maybe I need to. So remember this, I think I need to close this. I don't know how to save it in this software here. So I will just say once again, um, end this. And go back to my camera here and already disconnect the USB cable from this analog discovery tool and remove the cables and put this to the side. And now I have a second instrument here, which is a picoscope from USB powered oscilloscope. And this, as you can see, has two inputs, A and B. So I can measure two channels that I will use for the input and for the output. And it has a third connector that is labeled with AWG and it's AWG stands for arbitrary waveform generator. So it's a, it's a source, it's a generator. And um, so what I have now on the printed circuit board is, as you can see, it's the, it's the same resistor as before. And it's the capacitor that we had before, the 100 nano ohm, uh, nanofarad capacitor. And so now I will connect at first a cable for, for the source. And this has two, two wires and I will connect them as the full voltage across the resistor and across the, the capacitor. 
So this is now the source connected. And then I need two more cables to measure voltage. So I have, um, as you can see, a, a, a cable with red markings, a voltage probe. This is what I will use for the input voltage connected to channel A and connected to the input. And then I have a second probe cable with, as you can see, with yellow rings, yellow markings. And this is what I will connect to the second channel, to the output channel. Okay, and so now we have a source, we have input, we have output connected. And now I need to have uh, a second software, which is called the FRA frequency response analyzer for the picoscope. And it's loading. And hopefully finding the instrument. Ah, okay. And uh, it's not finding because I have not yet connected it. Uh, so I'm sorry for this. So this is the proper USB cable. And let's just start it once again. Dum, dum, dum. And now it's hopefully finding the instrument. Okay. And so we can see we have input channel, we have output channel. We can also have a frequency range here and there. Um, so we are now measuring between 10 hertz and once again, 100 kilohertz. And I will just push go. And then you can see once again at low frequencies, it's taking quite a time to do this measurement and at higher frequencies it's getting faster and faster. And it's building up this plot. And then we can see exactly the curve that was sketched before. So we get something constant at low frequencies. And then we have this corner frequency. We have this break frequency. And then it goes down with this minus 20 dB per decade. And if we would calculate now with the 10 kilo ohm resistor and a hundred nanofarad capacitor, what corner frequency you get, then it's really in this range here of um, around a hundred a um, hundred hertz, something like this. Um, I think at around 150, 50 something. So. Um, yeah, this is how then, as you can see, how the real filter looks like. It's exactly what we have drawn before and what we have calculated before. And then you can see that phase goes to minus 90 degree. And here at higher frequencies, interesting things once again happen. Um, and that's a question. N yeah, and this is because now here at the end, the output voltage gets very, very small. And it's just very difficult to measure the small voltage. And that's why we get uncertainties in the amplitude and also uncertainties in the phase. Mm. Yeah, and, and so it's, I think here it's not really a problem of the filter already. The filter should still work very well at this frequency. Um, it's, it's just more a problem of the measurement. Okay. So this was the second experiment that I would like to show. And the last thing that we could do is uh, we can have a short Kahoot quiz with six questions on filter applications. So I will just push the start button and then it should load the game pin and I will go to full screen mode. And there's the QR code. I will make it a little larger. And there's also the music. And I hope it's not too loud in the stream. I will maybe make it a little louder here in the room. I don't know, it's already on, on a full mode. Okay.
And now I have the time to look into the chat. So uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Mannschaft and to Court 04 and Mannschaft 1908 for for your comments. Highly appreciated. Uh, hopefully everything worked today with a good audio and video quality. No delays and stuff. So we have already six people connected to the Kahoot quiz. And this virtual room is filling up quickly. I'm not sure. We have three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 20 people in the room. And we have uh, very, very difficult names. But now I think almost everyone is connected. Yes. So I can push start. And we have six questions on filters for EMC applications. And the First question is, a low pass filter allows signals only to pass below a certain break frequency or corner frequency. How can this frequency be increased? So if we want to push this corner frequency to higher frequencies, what do we need to do? Do we need to have a higher resistance? Do we need to have a lower, no, uh, do we need to have a lower resistance, a higher resistance, a higher capacitance, or neither by changing R and C we would need to have an inductance to achieve this effect? And <laughs> Lots of people shouted the blue, blue, but the blue is wrong. We need to have a lower resistance. So if we, if you remember this formula, there was J omega RC. If, if the omega should be higher, then the R at the end should be lower uh, to have the same effect. So we need to have a lower resistance to go to higher frequencies. Okay, so no points for no one. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I, I never had this before. What happens here to the podium? But El Idrissi is on the first place, probably, probably because he answered the wrong answer the fastest. <laughs> Maybe I'm I'm not sure. So next question is: What is an analogy? or analogy of the low pass filter and its effect in mechanics. Um, for example, if we look at this spring mass system, is it is it the spring? Is it the inertia, let's say, of the mass? Is it the friction or is it the acceleration? Okay, and at least six people with the right answer. It's the inertia. If you have if you have a high mass, then it's always difficult and challenging to move this high mass rapidly. So this is acting like a low pass filter um, inertia in mechanical systems. And so we have Fringpong uh, taking the lead, uh, followed by El Idrissi and Toi Toi. I don't know how to pronounce this. And so the next question is, what else could you call a first order low pass filter? And the, um, the note just said that more than one answer could be right. So can you also call it or is a low, first order low pass filter also an integrator? Is it an averaging circuit? Is it a PI a pro proportional integral controller or is it also a smoothing circuit? And we already have 
15 answers and uh, still 20 seconds to think about an answer. Okay, and here nothing can go wrong because all these answers are correct. Um, so let's have a look at the podium. Oh, and there are one with a strange name, difficult name, last uh, is taking the lead. But everything is still very close. So we come to the fourth question, which is a true or false question. And the statement is a linear passive filter also works the very same way in reverse operation. Is this right or is it wrong? So this means right, this means wrong. You, you can also practice some basic German here and yeah, it's, it's not true, it's false. Um, if you reverse the order, you get a different, you get something different. So El Idrissi is once again taking the lead. Uh, followed by Trois and Thibault. We come to the fifth question. Uh, another statement, the performance of the filter depends on the source and the load. So you have a filter between the source and the load. Is this right or is this wrong? And it's right. What we have just done is looking, looking at the open circuit performance of the filter. If you change, if you change the impedance here of the load, if you change or the source, if you change the impedance of the load, uh, the filter performance, the transfer function will also change. Okay. So El, El Idrissi is very strong. Um, but Mbappé is, um, is climbing up to the third place. And we come to the last and deciding question. And this is what happens to the energy of the filtered components? Will they be only dissipated in the filter and converted and turned into heat? Or will they, will they be only reflected back to the source? Or is the energy amplified? Or does a combination of dissipation and reflection takes place for these unwanted filtered energy components or frequency components. And here we also already have 15 answers and 20 seconds more left to cast the vote. And the green answer is the right answer. So some portion of the unwanted energy is dissipated in the filter and will be also converted into heat, but usually most of it is just reflected back to the source. So then we have a podium. And on the third place with 380, 13 points, we have El Idrissi. And on the second place, we have Jean Brer. He is, oh, and on the first place, and we came from Drum is Mbappé. Oh, interesting, interesting. So congratulations. Unfortunately, I don't have any prizes to offer. So you just played for honor. So thanks for attending. That's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Maybe, maybe we will see each other again on Friday at this information exchange fair i will be there once again and maybe having some information about our university and then uh, just have a good day au revoir uh, yeah guten guten tag means uh, bonjour if you want to say tschüss or auf wiedersehen exactly auf wiedersehen and with this, I also close the program here, uh, exit the full screen mode, close this window, and maybe switch back to my, as I've learned now how this works, switch back to my full camera setup and uh, say bye bye. And I will click on uh, live stream anhalten. <laughs> Stop streaming in my OBS studio.